Genesis chapter 3, we graduated. Now we're going to introduce, we're, everything's fine here in Eden. Man and woman have joined together. Beautiful, beautiful thing that God has done. God's given man the help meet for him. And they're together in the Garden of Eden. They are, there's, there's no public indecency laws. Because there's no public. It's just that the whole, can you imagine the whole world populated by two people? You can frolic all you want to. Okay? And it was, it was perfect. Adam and Eve together, having access to all the food they could ever eat. Having access to the tree of life, only given one no-no, one commandment, one rule, only given one. Anything else that they want to do, there's no, they can't steal anything because everything is there for them. There's nothing to steal. There's no thought of Adam killing Eve. He loves her. This is now, he's, he said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. So there's no lust, nothing to lust after. There's no greed, there's no money. It's perfect. Somebody showed up for dinner. And I promise you, you understand the nature of Satan, he'll do it every time. When life gets perfect, he will show up every time. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. And I, you know me, I'm going to get into that part of it later, but not now. Yea, hath God said. Notice the subtlety of it. What's the first word out of Satan's mouth recorded? What's the first word? Yea. Which means, yes, yes, but see how I'm saying it? Not, yes, yes, comma, yay. So his subtlety in that he doesn't, his first word, I said I wasn't going to do this, <laughs> but I'm doing it. His first word is positive. Then added to a negative. Hath God said. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now notice he's not quoting God. He's not quoting God. And he's being very general. Yea hath God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Did God say that? Satan shows his true nature, his true character immediately. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. Notice she's not specific either. And I, that's bothered me for a long time. Because, and this really plays into who Satan is. Both trees were in the midst of the garden. Both of them were in the midst of the garden. They were not, God did not take the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the forbidden tree, and put it in some place that is so far away to get to, it would have been impossible for them to get to. He did not, he didn't put it on the moon. He didn't put it on Mars. He put it, he didn't even put it on the rim of Eden. He put it in the midst of Eden, next to the tree of life. That's how, I know the Bible doesn't say those specific words, but we know the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and we know that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was in the midst of the garden. Therefore, they were both there. And what God is doing is introducing to the world choice. Free 
will. Angels don't have it. No angel, no angel has free will, has choice. They do what God designed them to do. Goldfish don't have choice. No goldfish has ever built a city, a car. They haven't developed a banking system. They just eat and forget. That's goldfish. Eat and forget. Eat and forget. God gave man choice. You can't have choice without something to choose from and something adverse to give you the other side of why you might choose the other. So Eve says, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. One, two, three, four, five words she added. God did not say that. She added that. And, you know, I'm just, I have to be honest. I have to be biblically honest. Paul taught this when he taught in why the husband should rule, the bishop should be a man, the husband of one wife, and why all the writers of the Bible were men. He specifically said it was the woman who was in error, not the man. The woman, it was the woman who was deceived. And even without the initial deception, she is already adding to God's word. You know, would it have mattered had she gone over and touched the fruit? I don't think so. God did not give that commandment. He simply said, don't eat. And there's a difference. Okay? So she added to God's word, neither shall you touch it lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. Now we're contradicting God's word. For God doth know. Now we're adding to God's word. That in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes, that's the 33rd word there, eyes, shall be opened. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. I was in error for years because I would always say, quote that as saying, you shall be as God. But that's not what it says. As gods. As gods. Like Satan, the serpent, is. He is a little g, God. An immortal, angelic realm being. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we pray for the man that doesn't want to be prayed for tonight. And Father, it was a, out of a sense of common affection and decency, Lord, that we intervene in this man's life. And Father, we don't know him, but you brought him our way. And so we pray, dear God, that you would save that man. He needs to be saved. The path that he is on now is going to kill him. And then he will spend eternity in hell. And I'm asking you, Father, that you would save that man. And that when he is, when he realizes that the drugs are not going to do for him what he wants, when he realizes that Satan has double-crossed him, I pray, dear God, that he would find that Bible that by now has already been taken away or discarded or whatever, but God, he would find your word and that he would be saved. We ask you, Father God, to, to just step in in his life and may tonight be the beginning of that. And we pray, dear God, for our community and our neighborhood because of the spirit that is in this area. I hate it. And I pray, dear God, that you would help us to fight this battle using our faith, our prayers. And pray, dear God, that you would give us the victory. Save some souls, Father. And bless some people tonight who need blessed. 
Give us understanding, Father, of who our enemy is, how powerful he is, what he can do, what he cannot do. Show us, dear God, what we're up against and, and enlighten our minds and our hearts. Help us to not be ignorant of Satan's devices. And just, we thank you, Lord, for our church. We love you. We thank you, Lord, for saving us. We pray this in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. Um, turn to 2 Corinthians 11 because Paul then gives us a, a, an understanding of what Genesis 3 really is, is doing. Um, you have a, in 2 Corinthians 11, you have a double witness of, of Satan's, um, I, call, I call it his modus operandi, his method of operation. This is how Satan works. Okay? A lot of money is spent by the CIA to understand Russia, to understand China, North Korea, the Islamic states, to understand who could possibly be our enemies and how they would operate. A lot of money goes into think tanks who sit and think up scenarios of how a war might start or how somebody through espionage might try to come into our country to do us harm. A lot of money is spent on that to know this. The Bible gives us all that we need to know who our enemy is, what he's capable of, how he works, what to watch for, and how to defeat him. He can be defeated. And at the end of everything, the God of heaven is going to allow us to bruise Satan under our feet. And I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm, I'm in stomping mood. Okay? So, but the Bible then is our guide to teach us. God knows Satan. He made him. Satan doesn't get to choose who he serves the way you and I get to choose who we serve. He is built for deception and murder and killing. And that is exactly what he does. And he doesn't, he cannot be reasoned with. He cannot be, he, I, I don't want to say he cannot be stopped, but you cannot bargain with him. He's like in Job 41, when you read about Leviathan and God is, Showing Job Leviathan, he tells him, has anybody ever entered into a contract with Leviathan? Anybody ever had a meeting with him and said, calm down, Leviathan, man, we're trying to fish here. Has anybody ever done that? No, he's a beast, he's a monster, and you're not going to get anywhere with him. Anybody that's ever tangled with him said, I'll never do that again. So that's, that's who we're dealing with here. We're not dealing with somebody that when you bargain with, you're going to get the better end of the shake. You're not. If you bargain with the devil, he'll win. He'll win every time. So God's telling us how he works. So Paul says, 2 Corinthians 11, 1, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. That's us pastors. We're all the time begging you. Give, give me a few more minutes in the sermon, please. I mean, Paul's already 11 chapters into this letter. Would to God that you'd hold up with me. I still got some things to say here. For I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. Every pastor is that way about his church. He sees it like he sees his wife. If a man's trying to step in, I'm going to step in. I'm going to be jealous. God is a jealous God. Amen? He's a jealous God. He, is, he, is, he does not allow anybody to worship other gods before him. Or that's his commandment. I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I was espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So Paul says, whether you like it or not, I have to show you this. But I fear, and I've spent a lot of time in fear, worrying for people, worrying about my wife, worrying about my family, my daughters, my sons, my grandchildren, how they turn out. My goodness, I got more grandchildren coming. What world are they coming into? And that... Well, I mean, the devil used that on me hard. So I'm going, why do I keep having grandchildren? So anyway, because I give them candy, that's why. God's going to take care of it. But I fear lest by any means, as, and underline that word as, one of the most important words in the Bible, if you want to understand the Bible, as. 
Because God will always link one thing to another by the word as. As it was in the days of Noah. As Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights. As Lot. As Sarah. As Abraham. So the word as always links you, puts the puzzle pieces together. As the serpent beguiled Eve. So he's saying to you, go back and mark and study how Satan operated. How he did what he did. How he dis how who in here came out of another false church or religion or something like that? Who came out of some? Okay, we got we got a few. You were deceived. You were lied to. He's going to tell you how it happened. So that you don't get lied to anymore. Okay? And I listen, I've been preaching long enough to understand that this is going to go out and a lot of people are going to catch it and some are going to hear it and they're going to say amen to it. And in five years, they'll be down the road of false doctrine. It happens. People just, they just stop believing. They just give up. They quit. They let, even though they are informed of how Satan works, they fall for it. So, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And he means that. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, uh, David brings to mind all of the books of the Mormon church. You have the King James Bible. But then you must add to that the Book of Mormon. And then you must add to that the Pearl of Great Price. And then you must add to that the Doctrine and the Covenants. And then you must add to that what whatever apostle who's out there says. Whatever they say. So you got the Bible, Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, Doctrine and Covenants, and whatever the quorum says to tell you whether or not you're going to heaven or not. And you will never know. From one day to another, you will never know. The simplicity in Christ is, you call upon the name of the Lord, God chooses to save who he saves. And it's that simple. Okay, it is that simple. So, anybody who wants to remove you from the simplicity. And there are so many religions in the world, and all of them, there is a complication involved. There is something there that you will never grasp. Now, give you an, who came out of the Catholic Church? Catholic Church had its mysteries. The mystery of the Eucharist. The mystery of... The, of um, what else was there? I can't remember either. But it was things that you will never understand. The Catholic Church tells you, sitting in the pews, you will never understand what the popes understand. You let them tell you what to believe. And that is far removed from the simplicity that is in Christ. It removes salvation out of your hands, puts it in the hands of the church. Okay? They determine who's saved, who's not saved. So he says, and here's now, the methods bring about the results. The methods are there to bring about the results. The methods are, yea, hath God said, questioning God's word. Uh, you shall not surely die, contradicting God's word, for God doth know, adding to God's word. That's the methods in, in simplistic form. But then the results are, for if he that cometh preacheth, number one, another Jesus. Okay? And it just makes sense that the Jesus of the Mormon church is not the same Jesus as the Jesus of Bethel Church. Not the same Jesus. The Jesus of this Bethel Church is not the same Jesus of the Bethel Church, Redding, California. Where they tell you to go to a grave of some dead saint and suck all their glory out because they have leftover anointing in their grave 
And you can withdraw that and put that on you. That's necromancy. And the spirit is, it, I'm getting into that, but it, there's a different spirit and it's a different gospel. So for he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received. So the spirit that comes to us, comes to us by way of the word of God. And if the word of God that people have is different than this word of God, it is a different spirit. It is describing God in a different fashion. It is describing the work of God in a different way. It is diminishing Christ. It's removing away from the doctrines of grace and putting in there the doctrine of works. In every, in every false religion, there is a work or a performance-based blessing. And it's always must be attained by performance or by wealth or anything else. This is the only religious principle whereby you're guaranteed eternal life by faith alone. The only one. And I've, so I've said this before. To the extent that someone adds a work to salvation, they've corrupted the gospel. They've given you another gospel. For instance, um, I, and I knew a guy that had this happen. He was in a church in this town and he came forward and he asked Jesus to be in his heart. And they said, okay, you can ask Jesus to be in your heart. But now you have to speak in tongues. Okay. And he didn't know what to do. So he's just at the altar. He thinks he's got to wait for it. And they said, now here's how, here's how we do it. Did you hear what I said? Here's how we do it. Say hallelujah. So he said Hallelujah. Okay, say it again. Hallelujah. Say it again. Hallelujah. Say it faster and faster and faster. And he said he did that until gibberish showed up. And he said, Woo! He's got it. He's got the Holy Ghost. That's works. It works. Show me that in the Bible. Show me on the day of Pentecost where they had to do that. Show me in... Simeon's house where they did that. They spoke in tongues in Simeon's house. Show me in Simeon's house where Peter had to wind them up to get them to do that. And I've heard of all kinds of things where people had to, where tongues had to be generated. That is a works. And they say without it, you do not have the Holy Ghost. Therefore, you are not saved. So they've attached the performance of tongues upon salvation. That's just one example. Catholic Church, at, like I said, they add the confessional, they add penances, they add purgatory, they add very expensive mass services that must be held in order to get God to, to release somebody from purgatory. Usually in the tens of thousands of dollars it costs people to do this. They still, they still sell indulgences in countries around the world. The Catholic Church still sells indulgences whereby you sin... And it costs you so much per sin. So what does that say about the writ? Why are all mafia people Catholic? Because they got the money to get expunged from their dirty dealings. So they go to the priest. They get it, they get it wiped off. They pay the money. And then they go out and do it again. Okay. So that's, it's another gospel. He that cometh preacheth another Jesus, and we have not preached, or you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Paul is not being very nice to the Corinthian church. This, we think, was the last of the four letters that Paul sent to the Corinthian church. And he's not being nice. Because he just told them, I'm asking you to put up with me, but I guarantee you, I guarantee you, that somebody's going to come along and preach this other Jesus and you're going to go, oh wow, that's, boy, Paul didn't tell us that. You're going to listen to him. And Paul said, that's why I'm jealous. Because now I know Satan is involved because that's what he does. He brings in the deception and you go back to Genesis 3 to learn how he deceives. And once you learn how he deceives, then you understand you just got deceived. Because you accepted something that was not written in the Word of God. You accepted that. Uh, Psalm 119. 
So, turn, Psalm 119, John 8, 44. Turn to John 8. So I'm really, I'm contrasting the two here in these two verses. I'm giving you a rundown of the character of Satan. What he does, how he does it, what, how he thinks. My dad would take me out in the woods, show me squirrels. Uh, Jaden, if I'm going to go look for squirrels to kill, do I look for them in holes, caves, water, or trees? Okay. Trees. Trees. Okay. Take him out in the woods, Mick. Okay. My daddy took me out in the woods to show me where squirrels are. You want to see squirrels? Look up. You want to see deer? Don't look up in trees. There's a big old buck up there. Third limb from the top. Okay. You learn their nature. You learn where they're going to be. And I'm not the hunter that my dad was, but I can pretty much pick a spot. I can pick a spot. That I can do. So this is what we're doing. We're understanding how Satan works, how he will show up, because he will. And he has, and I, that's another aspect, he's got thousands with him. He can't be everywhere at once, so he has a whole legion of the third of the angelic realm. So John 8, 44, Jesus said, You are of your father the devil. The lust of your father you will do. So what do we know about Satan's character? What do we know about his character? What? No, back up. We're not to the liar part yet. He's a luster. He lusts. He wants. He covets. He covets. Okay? And he passes that covetousness. What does he want? Wants to be like the Most High. Wants to sit on God's throne. Wants to be God. So, the first thing, that's the first thing you learn. Slow down, you are, the, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. So, that's the, one of the first things we find out about Satan, is that he lusts and he covets. God doesn't. Jesus didn't. They didn't have to. They had everything. Okay? We just sang that tonight. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king. My father is rich in houses and lands. He owns it all. There's nothing that's not his. So the devil doesn't... He was given, but he wants more than what he was given. You're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. What's the second thing? He will kill. He will not. He hates life. He is the enemy of life. He has the power of death. The Bible says. So he is a murderer. He will kill the innocent. God doesn't. And understand this. God gets a lot of bad press now from liberals in this country. Because they think, liberals think they know more about Christianity than us Christians who read the Bible every day. And they say, you're God that you follow. You say you're against abortion. Yet your God sent people in to kill other people, innocent people. If God thought they were innocent, he wouldn't have killed them. There's, it's just like that guy judging what we did with this man that was passed out up here. We saved this man's life. I don't carry Narcan. You got any Narcan on your run? No! But we, yeah, and it doesn't hang on trees. We can't pull grass up and, okay? But I knew who did. They're the ones 
who are hired to do these things. They are public servants. So it's like this guy judging me, telling me that he, you know, he knows everything about me and all this stuff. What was that? Where was I going with that? Oh, anyway, it's liberals telling us that our God is a murderer because he sent people in to kill women, children, and babies. If they were innocent, God wouldn't have killed them. They must have been guilty in the eyes of God. And God knew it. God is the judge of all nations. And he is the only judge of all nations. He is the one who actually sees what everybody does. And there may be somebody that you know that you think has fallen on bad times. And it's happened you know, to them unjustly and so on and so on. But maybe you don't know. The truth of it really is. God was getting them. And they just don't want to be honest about it. Okay? But anyway, Satan's a murderer. He kills those who are innocent and the un, he unjustly takes life away. He is the one who introduced death and murder into the world. Death in Genesis 3, murder, Genesis chapter 4. Because we know that Cain was inspired, he was of the wicked one. And that inspired him to slay his own brother. So he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. So now we have another part of his character. When you say of somebody, well, they say something right every now and then. What you're saying is most of what they say is wrong, but I listen to them because every now and then they're right. Truth is exclusive of any lie or corruption to the truth okay satan does not live in a land called truthville he abides in liarsville and liars know that you can always lie best by mingling truth with your lie they know that so um steve brother steve sent me an article this afternoon about a guy that was cured from sickle cell by way of genetic alteration. Okay? God wrote it in a man's DNA to have sickle cell. That's what God said for this man. Man says, we're smarter than God, so let's rewrite this man's genes. You know how they did it? They used the HIV virus to do it. Because HIV virus is a very aggressive virus and it goes in quickly and makes the alterations very fast and alters the DNA. Some cancer is viral based. Not all, but some is because of a virus that causes the DNA to be written in a wrong fashion. Um, the H. pylori bacter thing where you get an uh, ulcer in your stomach, they now know it's caused by a bacteria that bacteria can cause the alteration of genetics in certain cells, which can cause cancer. Anyway, where's it going with that? Uh, he does not abide in the truth. So what they did was, and here's my point in this. When they genetically altered this man to heal him of sickle cell, they added a lie to the truth of his DNA. It's like the young guy that I made the video of a few years ago who decided to put on a dress and a wig and go in the girls' bathroom and locker rooms at Hillsborough High School. He was adding truth to a lie, or a lie to truth. The truth of it was his genes, he had a Y chromosome, which means he is male. Putting on a wig and a dress does not alter your genes. Does not alter your genetics. You still have a Y chromosome, you are male. That that's what the devil does. He loves to add deception to the truth or a little truth to the deception. He gets you to swallow it. It's like getting a dog to eat a worm pill. Right? Got to mix it with something for them to take it. It's the hardest thing in the world to get them to do it. Okay? Anyway, he abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. He cannot tell the truth. So think about the opposites. Can God lie? Can the devil tell the truth? 
see the opposites. That's why I put Psalm 119, 160, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Not only was the Bible right originally, it still is. God cannot lie, and the devil cannot tell the truth. They are exclusive of each other. There is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. He, Satan, does not love planet Earth. He is a destroying spirit. He destroys and devours everything he can. He does not love humans. He does not love this earth. He is not benevolent at times. There's not a little good in his evil. There's not a little light in his darkness. None of that. He speaketh of his own because he's a covetous spirit. For he is a liar and the father of it. Uh, Lindsay, I don't know if you heard me preach about you this morning, but the lie, I remember the lie you told. You were, it was almost like you were covering your backside. That's the picture I still have in my mind, is you telling that lie, and even though your hands weren't literally back here, I'm putting your hands back there, because that's what you were doing. You were covering up something you did wrong. We know you did it wrong. We asked you, did you do it? No, I didn't do that. We knew you were lying. But where did that come from? She inherited it from me and her mama, who got it from these two, and her. And it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Okay? He started the lie, sowed it into, it's in the DNA that we're liars. Amen? This is why we must accept God's word alone as the only source of truth. Alone. Okay. Uh, very quickly, the servant, the serpent of Genesis 3 is the devil. And the reason why I say that is that social media, there's some people on social media says the devil, the serpent is actually a benevolent spirit. In India, China, Japan... Asian countries and near Asian countries, they worship serpents and dragons as benevolent gods. And that's what they believe. They believe that they are, that the dragon, uh, the Chinese ideology is that the dragon is the chief of the gods. He's the head of all the spirits and uh, so on and so forth. And so there are some who say that the, the Pakistan, India area, they worship serpents, physical serpents. And they see them as bringers of light. They say that there's a serpent in everybody's bottom, the base of their spine, and he needs to be released so he can activate your pineal gland and give you illumination in your third eye, okay? which is a lie. It's not the gospel. It's a replacement for the gospel. So the serpent is the devil. There's no doubt about that in scripture. Acts 13, 10, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. So the child of the devil is a devil. Amen. The son of a duck is a duck. The son of a cow is a cow. Son of a deer is a deer. Son of a squirrel is a squirrel. And the son of a devil is a devil. And it's full of subtlety and mischief. Always perverting something. Thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness. That's another aspect to his nature. He stands against right living. People, there's a way to live right. In this world where all the lines are blurred. And I mean every line is blurred now. There still is a way to live right. And speak right. What comes out of your actions and what comes out of your mouth speaks very loudly of who you are and what you are. And he is the enemy of right living, right speaking. When people curse, that's, that's of Satan. Cursing's not of God. 
Talking dirty is not of God. Lying is not of God. Gossiping about people is not of God. None of these things that we do with our mouth is of God. They're of the devil. He's the enemy of all righteousness. Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? That's his primary nature. To pervert the right ways. To take a straight path and make it crooked. Which is easier to drive? You're going to drive back home to Utah. In Kansas there is. But not in Missouri. Not in half of Colorado. Okay? He takes straight paths and makes them crooked. Makes them difficult. Makes life hard. Doesn't he? It would be easiest to walk straight down this aisle. But if I had to zigzag in and out of every pew, okay, and, and that's, that's a picture of what he does. Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What, are, what does the word wiles mean? Ways, but what kind of ways? He's the trickster. He's Loki. In the Nordic religions, Loki is, if, if you wake up one day and, the, and your milk bottle was turned over, they would say Loki did that. Loki showed up last night and spilled our milk. Or, you know, if your barn accident caught on fire, Loki did that. So in a lot of these mythologies, there is a trickster devil. Well, he is a wily beast, like a raccoon. Or a fox. Or any other kind of wily beast. Who comes in, causes trouble. Destructs things. Destroys things. Tears things up. So on. He corrupts things. The wiles of the devil. James 4 verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. This, this I should teach for a little while. About resisting. And I'll, just a little bit tonight, but remember he is a beast that does not choose. He cannot choose. And God has implanted it into his being. That if you resist him, he will flee. So then it makes you ask the question, why did I ever give in to begin with? Because it was easy. He made it easy. But then as we grow, God teaches us how to resist. How to not do that. This guy that was out here on drugs, I feel sorry for him. Right now, he does not have the ability to stop doing drugs. He doesn't even have the desire to stop doing it. He hasn't. He hasn't died enough times. I lost. My, my first cousin lost a son. To his umpteenth drug overdose. He refused. The help. He didn't want the help. But he couldn't do it by himself. Heroin, meth, these things have so much power over people. We're losing the war. You understand that, right? We're losing the battle. Cubby used to be a cop. He knows. It's out on the streets everywhere. People are doing it all over the place. Okay? But God teaches us how to resist. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober. There's your key right there. Be sober. Be vigilant. Thank you, Roy. Roy said Wednesday night, car pulled down the driveway. He stepped out the door. They pulled out. Okay? So, and I'm being dead honest about this. If Roy can't make it some service, I would like for some guy to be out there. Almost from now on. Because we have drugs in this area. 
And I don't trust leaving that door unwatched. Not anymore. We have kids here during the day. I don't trust them just running around like I used to. It's getting, it's getting scary, people. Okay? I'm Look there, Sister Rosanna, she's holding that baby tight. She'd give her life to protect that child. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about. He doesn't sit and wait for it. He goes to cause it, seeking whom he made it. He's looking to devour. He doesn't wait for an innocent victim to walk by. He goes after. So you resisted him. You won the battle. He fled. He's coming back. Different way, different day, but he's coming back. Amen? Boy, it's a good lesson to learn. Some good stuff here. This Bible's good. Amen? It's like being in Boy Scouts. Getting a field guide to nature. Learning about the evils of the forest. Father, watch over our children. Please. God will spill our own blood for our children. But even that might not be enough. God, please watch over our children. Watch over our homes and our families, our marriages. Please, God, bless our marriages. Bless them. Give people love for one another, couples love for one another. Cause, Lord, to help us to stand against the wiles of the devil. Having done all to stand, to withstand, to keep standing, to fall and get down and get back up and stand again. God, help us to do that. Our enemy never stops. So we can't either. Help us to be ever vigilant. And help us to learn, Father, what we must learn for your kingdom's sake and our soul's sake. We pray this in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.